In this short video, we're going to talk about linear or linearity properties of finite sense. And really what that means is we want to understand how can we do or start to do linear algebra on vector spaces where the vectors are not Euclidean vectors, but some other objects. And for us, that really is going to mean polynomials or more general types of functions, or maybe matrices. So let's start by defining what we mean by linear combination. Remember, in our general vector space, we might have a strange definition for vector addition or scalar multiplication, in which case we'll use this different notation O plus for the vector addition and O dot for the scalar multiplication. But the idea is just the same as we had in Euclidean space. We form a linear combination by taking scalar multiples of vectors and then adding them together. And for us, for the most part, we're not going to need to use this uh, O dot and O plus notation because it's going to be the usual scalar multiplication. It's going to be the usual addition of whatever objects we're using. And so we'll just write it in the usual way. Uh, span still has the same definition that we had with the Euclidean spaces. It's going to be the set of all linear combinations of an element in a set. So for example, remember Pn is the set of all polynomials of degree n or less. And so really what that means is that a polynomial in Pn, so if I have a polynomial P of x, and it belongs to my vector space Pn, I can write P of x as the constant coefficient plus the coefficient on x plus the coefficient on x squared, and so on all the way until I get to the coefficient on x to the power of n. And sure enough, that is a linear combination of the powers of x, including x to the power of 0, which will count as 1. So any polynomial can be written as a linear combination of those powers of x. So we could write that Pn is the span of those powers of x starting from 0 up to n. Now, when we're going to look at fun excuse me, when we're going to look at equations with these uh, new vectors, uh, some of the vectors will be polynomials, some will be other types of functions. We're going to have to use some facts from algebra. And so one of the facts that we're going to use is that a uh, polynomial of degree n has exactly n roots. Now, we have to count multiplicities, and some of those roots may be imaginary. But really what's important for us to understand is that you can only have n, a finite number of them. And so, as an example, if I look at this cubic polynomial, uh, you can factor that out and determine that it has exactly three roots, x equals 1, x equals minus 1, and x equals negative 3. For exponential functions, and in our case we're going to have our base is always going to be positive, and uh, we're not going to take the base equal to 1 because that really just gives you a constant function. Uh, so for those bases which are positive and not equal to 1, the domain of that exponential function is all real numbers, and the range is all positive numbers. Remember that an exponential function can never be 0, and it can never be negative. And uh, we also have these uh, 0 as a horizontal asymptote. If you have a base which is greater than 1, then as x approaches negative infinity, a to the x approaches 0. And on the other hand, if you have a, 
a fraction between 0 and 1 as your base, then the, as x approaches positive infinity, a to the power of x approaches 0. And then uh, another property that we're going to make use of is that you can really do a change of base. Normally we see a change of base formula for logarithms, but we know that logs and exponential functions are directly connected. They're inverses of each other, so it makes sense that we're going to have a change of base formula for exponential functions, and it's just based on the fact that uh, any number, any positive number a, uh, can be written as e to the power of natural log of a, because e and natural log are inverses of each other. And so that means that using the properties of exponents, a to the power of x can be rewritten as e to the natural log of a times x. Now, one thing that we're going to use over and over again, and we've actually used this um, if you've ever solved any problems where you needed the partial fractions decomposition of a rational function, is the fact that polynomials are completely determined by their coefficients. And so what that means is if you have two polynomials of the same degree, if we're going to say that they are equal to each other as a function, and remember, as a function means for all values of x, then that can only be true if the corresponding coefficients are equal to each other. And this is the fact that we use when we find the partial fractions decomposition. And which means that if you have a polynomial which equals the zero polynomial, so remember z of x is really the zero function, or you could call it the zero polynomial if you want to, in the context of polynomials. So you could think of it as zero plus zero times x plus zero times x squared, or you just think of it as z of x equals zero uh, for all values of x. And so the only way that a polynomial can equal the zero function is if all of its coefficients equal zero. And again, a reminder, when we say equality here, p of x equals z of x, we're not saying that that's true for just one particular value of x. We're saying that that's true for all values of x. So let's do some linear algebra. Here I have a function, 2x squared minus x minus 10 all over x cubed. I'd like to know, does that belong to the span of the functions 1 over x, 1 over x squared, and 1 over x cubed? All right, well, let's do some uh, basic algebra. I can distribute the division of x cubed among the three terms in the numerator, and I get 2 over x minus 1 over x squared minus 10 over x cubed. And sure enough, that is a linear combination of the functions in our set. So since it is, it must belong to the span. All right, let's look at another rational function with a different set of functions. So I've got uh, negative x squared minus 5x minus 10 over 2x cubed minus x squared minus 10x. And I'd like to know if that is in the span of 1 over x, 1 over 2x minus 5, and 1 over x plus 2. And uh, if I look at the denominator, I can actually factor that as x parentheses 2x minus 5 and uh, x plus 2. And from there, I can say, oh, well, those are exactly the denominators in uh, my polynomial, I'm mean, sorry, in my set here. So I can find a partial fractions decomposition. Now, I don't have to go through all the steps in this particular question because it just wants to know, is it in the span? And since the partial fractions decomposition is going to exist, I don't need to find A, B, and C. I can just answer the question and say, yes, it belongs to that span.
So now let's talk about linear independence. What would we expect? Well, we can write down a dependence equation. And if that dependence equation only has the trivial solution, uh, that means that all of the coefficients in that dependence equation have to equal 0, then you can conclude that the uh, set is linearly independent. And so it's this dependence equation that we're going to use when we're talking about linear independence or linear dependence. Of course, we would say the set is linearly dependent if you have a non-trivial solution, meaning that there's one of those coefficients, at least one of them, which is non-zero. So let's take a look at this uh, example here. We're given some set of functions. It's defined uh, on an interval i. So that's a subset of functions defined on the same interval, common interval for all of them. Then we would say that, oh, for functions, the zero vector is that zero function, z of x, where z of x equals zero for all values of x. So we wouldn't say equal to zero. Zero would be a scalar here. We need to put the appropriate uh, zero vector for this vector space, which would be the zero function. So if it, we only have uh, the c's equal to zero, the coefficients equal to zero, then it's linearly independent. Now, and again, this has to work for all values of x in the interval. So the same c values have to be independent of x and have to work for all values of x in the interval. So let's take a look at this particular set. Familiar functions, sine of x, cosine of x, and tangent of x, all of them are defined on the interval from negative pi over 2 to pi over 2. And we'd like to know, is this a linearly independent set? Well, uh, we would have to set up a dependence equation. Remember, on the right-hand side, 0 for this function space means the 0 function, so z of x. And we need to find values of c1 and c2 and c3, which work for all values of x between negative pi over 2 and pi over 2. Now, it's actually helpful that we have to have the same values of the coefficients for all values of x, because then we can have the following strategy. We can make good choices of x, which will help simplify the equation. And let's see an example of what I mean. In this equation, in this dependence equation, I could choose x equal to 0. Whatever c values work for the entire interval have to work for x equal to 0, and that's advantageous because sine of 0 is 0, tangent of 0 is 0, cosine of 0 is 1, and of course z of 0, z of any number, is 0, and that reduces nicely to c2 has to equal 0, and that has to be true for all values of x. So now we know the value of c2, we still have to determine the values of c1 and c3. Now, there's no nice uh, reduction that we can get with sine of x and tangent of x. Uh, but what we can do is choose two different values of x. Say x1 equals pi over 4, x2 equals pi over 3. And if I substitute x1 equals pi over 4, I get the equation that root 2 over 2 c1 plus c3 has to equal 0. And if I use pi over 3, I get root 3 over 2 c1 plus root 3 c3 equals 0. And then we just have to solve this system of equations, two equations, two unknowns. And uh, we don't have to do any fancy linear algebra here. We can just uh, solve for c3 in the first equation solve for c3 in the second equation. We could subtract those two or set them equal to each other. In either case, we'd wind up with both c1 and c3 would have to equal 0.
and that means that all of the coefficients have to equal zero and we must have a linearly independent set on that particular interval. Uh, so let's look at some special cases uh, where we can decide if a set is linearly independent or not uh, without having to revert to the uh, dependence equation. So uh, first of all, if we only have one vector, uh, whatever vector means in this particular space, as long as that vector is not the zero vector, then that set is linearly independent. If you have only two vectors, just like in Euclidean space, they will be linearly independent provided that they're not parallel to each other. And, and, and that really means that they are not scalar multiples of each other. Now, if it's functions, remember it's scalar multiples of each other for all values of x in the interval, not just one or a small number of values. It has to be for all values of x in the interval. And then finally, just like in Euclidean space, uh, if you have a set and you can write one of the vectors as a linear combination of the rest, uh, then uh, that is going to be a linearly dependent set. And um, I use this abbreviation WLOG. WLOG is something that you see in mathematics a lot. WLOG. What does that mean? Uh, that is without loss of generality. And what does that phrase mean? That means that in this, we said, oh, we're going to write V1 as a linear combination of the rest. But we could have chosen any of the Vs in the set. We could have said V n is a linear combination of the remaining ones, or v4 is a, a linear combination of the remaining ones. So it's just a, a simple way of just saying, we're just going to choose one. It's going to be v1. If we can write v1 as a linear combination of the rest, uh, then it would be the same result as if it were v2 or v5 or vn. All right, here's another example. We've got three functions. You know, the, the one here means the function f of x equals one, all right? So f of x equals one for all values of x. So this is not the scalar. And we'd like to know, is this a linearly independent set? Well, we have an identity in this case. We have the Pythagorean identity that sine squared x plus cosine squared x equals one. And that's true for all values of x. And so that means uh, we can write this function, f of x equals 1, as a linear combination of the other two functions in the set. So the set is linearly dependent. Here I have a set of three polynomials. And I'd like to know, is this set linearly independent? Well, in this case, I don't have a nice identity to help me. I'm going to have to go to the dependence equation here. And again, remember the right-hand side is going to be our zero polynomial. So really, you could think of this as being the constant zero plus zero times x plus zero times x squared plus zero times x cubed. And of course, I can continue that as much as I want. But the highest degree on the left-hand side is 3. So really, it's just saying that all the coefficients on the right-hand side are going to be 0. So what I'll do is I'll collect the like terms, meaning that I'll collect all the coefficients on the x cubed, on the x squared. Uh, and this should have been an x. Uh, that is a mistake, and I apologize for that. So let's go ahead and you know, let's just etch that out. And um, I can say that, oh, okay, well, minus C2 minus C3 has to equal 0. Minus C1 plus C2 has to equal 0. And then C1 plus C3 has to equal 0. And write that as a matrix equation. And now I'd like to be able to find the solution to that matrix equation. And I can find that. That would really be what? 
That would be the null space of that matrix. So I'm going to go ahead and transform that to reduced row echelon form. And then I can sight read that, look, I have two leading columns, one free column. And I can sight read the basis then for that null space as being negative 1, negative 1, and 1. Uh, that's clearly a non-zero vector. We have a non-trivial solution then. And that means our set is linearly dependent. Now, uh, another way that we could have uh, got to that conclusion a bit faster is if we looked at this set carefully, we could have made the observation that the third polynomial is actually the sum of the first two. And if we'd made that observation, then we could have concluded by inspection that S is linearly dependent. So let's look at another example. Again, I have three polynomials, and uh, we need to find the solutions to this dependence equation. But here we're going to get a break, because if I look at this carefully, the only uh, term that has an x cubed comes from the third polynomial. So over here, the coefficient on x cubed is 0. All the coefficients are 0. So on the left-hand side, I just have c3 times 2x cubed. That has to equal 0. And the only way that that can equal 0 for all values of x is if c3 equals 0. So I've determined that c3 equals 0. Now I only have two terms on the left-hand side, or two polynomials. And I can make the same observation, that on the left-hand side, the only x squared term will come from this second polynomial. It'll be c2 times x squared. That has to equal 0 times x squared on the right-hand side, which means that, well, c2 has to equal 0. And then finally, uh, if I have c1 times 2 plus x equals the 0 function, well then c1 times x has to equal 0, meaning for all values of x, for all values of x, meaning that c1 has to equal 0. And since the only solution is trivial, then uh, this, the uh, set is linearly independent. Now, why was that so much easier? What, what, what shortcut did we have? Uh, in this particular example, well, the degree of each polynomial was different. The only x cubed was in the rightmost polynomial. The only x squared was in the middle. Uh, and so I was able to, to uh, kind of go down in terms of degrees and say that, oh, the coefficient on the highest degree has to be 0, and then I can repeat the process. The coefficient on the next highest degree is 0, and, all, and so on. And so the, if the degree of a set of, I mean, sorry, if a set of polynomials has different degrees, then we can in conclude that the set is linearly independent. So if I have a set of polynomials, all with distinct degrees, they don't have to be in ascending order, but the degree of each one has to be different, uh, then you conclude automatically that it is a linearly independent set. So that works nicely for polynomials. What about exponentials? Well, we have to use a different approach. We're going to go ahead and write out our dependence equation. Again, in this case, z of x is still the zero function. We just don't think of it as a polynomial now. We just think of it at as z of x equals 0 for all values of x. Uh, and what we're going to do is we'd like to get, and we have a great advantage with exponentials in this because exponentials are never 0. So I can go ahead and multiply through by 2 to the power of x. Or you could think of it as dividing everything by 2 to the power of negative x. So I've got c1 by itself with no exponential function multiplied by it. And now we're going to do some calculus and take advantage of the limit properties of exponential functions that we discussed at the beginning of the 
of the uh, video. So we have a base of 2. That's greater than 1. So I know that as x approaches negative infinity, 2 to any power of x is going to approach 0. So take the limit on both sides. On the right-hand side, it's always 0. So as x approaches any number, the right-hand side is going to be 0. And on the left-hand side, while well, the exponentials are going to go to 0, and the constant, of course, doesn't change. So I'm just left with c1 equals to 0. So now I've got a smaller equation, only with c2 and c3, and I can repeat the process. Since 2 to the power of 4x is never 0, let me just divide every term by 2 to the power of 4x. And again, I'll have c2 by itself, and then c3 times 2 to the power of 2x, and of course, if I take 0 and divide it by some positive number, of course, I'll get 0. So the right-hand side is still c of x. Now I'll take the limit as x approaches negative infinity, and I get c2 equals 0. And then finally, uh, here I have c3 times some positive number equals 0 for all values of x, so c3 has to equal 0. And we can conclude then uh, that we only have the trivial solution, c1, c2, c3 equals to 0. This set must be linearly independent. And this would work, remember all of our exponential functions have the same base and their uh, exponents were different, and so are different coefficients in the exponents, and uh, that will always lead to a linearly independent set. Now, in our theorem here, uh, we're using e as our base. But remember, we have our change of base formula. So this will be true for any positive base. So the base could be any positive number and not equal to 1. And this theorem will still be true. And we'll see that in this example. Here, I actually have three different bases. And the question is, is it's going to be a linearly independent set? Well, our theorems only uses E as a base. So let's go ahead, before we can use the theorem, let's use the change of base and rewrite each of these functions in terms of base E. And uh, once I do that, I can see that the coefficient on x in each one of these functions is different. They all have the same base now. So applying the theorem, I can conclude that s is linearly independent.